By the time of his state funeral in March 1953, the man the world knew affectionately as Uncle Joe Stalin had been dead for four days. The people of the Soviet Union wept openly for their dead leader. To the Russian people, Stalin was a savior, the great leader who had plucked them and the country from the jaws of Hitler's Nazis and kept the Americans at bay. As they filed past his corpse, few cared to recall that Stalin had another, darker reputation as the murderer of millions of his own people. I mean, there are other words that you could use to, to describe him, but evil actually is a pretty good one. Stalin turned Soviet Russia into one of the bloodiest killing grounds the world had ever seen. As a direct result of Stalin's policies, something like 20 million over the period were arrested, maybe 7 million were shot. Everything that he built turned to dust and everything was simply destroyed. In late 1923, Vladimir Lenin, the leader of the Bolshevik party and father of the Russian Revolution, lay demented and dying near Moscow. He was obsessed by one question, who would succeed him as leader of the country? There were two front runners in the race, the dashing intellectual and founder of the Red Army, Leon Trotsky, and the ruthless 43-year-old party secretary, Joseph Stalin. A lot of people that Trotsky was the natural successor. He had all of the intellectual, the ideological, the organizational ability, the personality to lead. He was a leader, the leader in the Civil War, of none of which qualities Stalin could share. In southern Russia at the turn of the last century, Stalin excelled as a bank robber, agitator, and sometime assassin. Forever in and out of jail, the violence and paranoia which would mark him out in later years were already visible. He had a very devious, cunning and somewhat paranoid personality from an early stage. He clearly wasn't um, one of the lads. For almost 20 years, Stalin was a hunted man only once in his early life did he experience anything that came close to normality. It wouldn't last. He met this um, beautiful young uh, Georgian girl, Yekaterina Svanidze, and they married. And she had a child, um, but contracted typhus, it is thought, and died. It is said that uh, when he was at her graveside, uh, he told the people there that a cold stone had entered his heart. He had lost all feeling for humanity. In March 1917, the Russian Revolution erupted. The Tsar Nicholas II was deposed, and a year later, he and his entire family were shot. With the capital Petrograd in turmoil, Stalin's moment had come. Making his way across Russia from a prison camp in Siberia, he found a city filled with revolutionary soldiers. For Stalin, the endless imprisonment was about to pay off. Throughout 1917, he was uh, on all of the main organizing bodies of the Bolshevik party in Petrograd, preparing for the revolution. When a second revolution came in October of the same year, Lenin's Bolsheviks were in control and Stalin was closer to the power he had always craved. With cold efficiency, Stalin began to maneuver himself into taking control of the party. Once my brother took me to the Bolshoi in Moscow where a big party meeting was being held. I was very excited. I wanted to hear Lenin and Trotsky speak. Standing next to Lenin and Trotsky on the stage that night was Stalin. 
My brother nudged me and said, that's the real dictator of Russia. In January 1924, Lenin died and Stalin saw the chance to seize power. Stalin was in control of so much of the organization of the state and of the party, particularly of the party. Major committees were staffed by him. Once you have that sort of power of patronage, of putting people in place, they're your people. I think what they saw in Stalin, yes, was a leader who was going to direct the party without the factional squabbles that they'd been listening to since 1921. Aware of Stalin's real character, Lenin wrote just before his death, Having become general secretary, he has enormous power in his hands, and I am not sure that he always knows how to use that power with sufficient caution. The party decided to ignore Lenin's warning about Stalin. It was a decision they and millions of others would soon regret. He was an unforgiving person, phenomenally unforgiving. All those who somehow displeased him were doomed to die, sooner or later. Stalin took control, and by the end of the 1920s, his hold on power was complete. A 30-year orgy of violence and terror was about to begin. In 1927, Stalin introduced his first five-year plan for massive and accelerated industrialization of the Soviet Union. But for this great leap, as he called it, he needed one thing in abundance, food. Food wasn't being supplied in the, on the scale that they wanted it, and they couldn't therefore fund and, and continue with um, the huge industrialization program that they had. So the debate was settled in the end by Stalin, who said, OK, we're going to collectivize. Stalin forced collectivization on the countryside, turning peasant smallholdings into massive state-controlled farms. And although party propaganda films showed life on the collective farms as some sort of paradise on earth, the reality was very different. For the peasantry, it was a catastrophic disaster. And in the Ukraine in particular, where resistance to collectivization was at its strongest, uh, a still untold number of millions of people died. One million people died in the northern Caucasus alone, some even resorting to cannibalism. Their suffering meant nothing to Stalin. He looked for scapegoats. The ones who didn't like it were the most successful peasants, the so-called kulaks. And they were the ones who opposed collectivization because they had most to lose. So you just take the kulaks and either you kill them or you send them somewhere to the far north and let them settle there and they'll die out. And five million such people died as purely as a result of the collectivization. Those who weren't killed by Stalin were sent to work camps called gulags. Deliberately situated in the harshest areas of Russia, prisoners were turned into slave laborers and worked to death. Huge industrial schemes like the Dnieper Dam or the Bellamore Canal became a living hell for hundreds of thousands who died during their construction. Nobody told us anything whatsoever, no reason why we, why we there, why they took us there, you know, what we've done wrong, why, why we were there. Nobody told us anything. We've just been taken as a slave, you know. Maria Sklugotsky was 18 years old in 1939 when she and her entire family were deported from their home in southern Poland to a labor camp in Siberia. People were stuck packed. We could hardly move at all in the train. But I know a lot of people. I was, I was seeing some people and children thrown away from the train when they was dead. That's it. Nobody was buried. After a three-month train journey, Maria and her family arrived in Krasnoyarsk in eastern Siberia. We had to go to work, you see, to forest. Because they says, if you don't go to work, we don't get any food whatsoever. We were working, cutting trees, you know, and that in forest. I had to walk 
and my knees from three to trees, you know, because snow was very, very high. If you walk, you should just fall deep in it. People die just like a flies. Children, and particularly young people, nearly all died. You die, you die, that's it. Not that their fates would ever move Stalin. He once commented, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is simply a statistic. At the beginning of the 1930s, Stalin's grip on power in Russia was absolute, and for the people of the Soviet Union, it would become the bloodiest decade of his rule. I think that by the end of the 1920s, Stalin was in the grips of some form of paranoia and saw himself surrounded by enemies, internal, external, in the party, in the country. And the terror, to some extent, was driven by his own paranoid fears. What became known as the Great Terror began at the Communist Party Congress in 1934, where Stalin was expecting his re-election as party secretary to be a formality. To his horror, 300 of the delegates voted against his nomination, and only three against the popular party favorite, Kirov. That reinforced his sense that there was um, a faction in the party uh, who were trying to unseat him, and he then began to see enemies everywhere. Stalin's revenge for this treachery was swift. Kirov was assassinated in mysterious circumstances later that year. Of the 1,961 delegates who had attended the 17th Congress, 1,108 of them were shot. Of the 139 Central Committee members, 98 were shot. The purges were a device to really to um, consolidate the new discipline that Stalin was imposing on the society. Everybody knew that if you didn't give total loyalty and visible dedication to Stalin, you could be sent to the cellars of the Lubyanka and executed immediately, or you could be sent to prison or camp for 25 years, and many were. From their headquarters in the Lubyanka, the NKVD, under Stalin's orders, spread fear throughout the country. Thousands were arrested and accused of everything from spying and sabotage to plotting Stalin's assassination. Stalin himself signed thousands of death warrants. One word, one movement of his finger would change the fate of millions of people, the fates of whole nations. Boris Yefimov was one of the Soviet Union's leading political caricaturists during the 30s. His brother Koltsov, a writer, was a victim of Stalin's terror. My older brother was a very well-known popular figure, very energetic, intelligent, an independent person. Stalin didn't like this sort of person. He only liked those who fulfilled his orders without any hesitation. At last, the day, or the night to be precise, of Koltsov's fate arrived. On the night of February the 2nd, 1940, after a year in an NKVD prison, Koltsov was shot. As the brother of one of Stalin's enemies, Boris Yefimov was also targeted for arrest. To be compassionate was not in his nature. Why did he spare me then? The answer is simple. He liked my drawings. In exile in Mexico, Stalin's old enemy Trotsky was murdered with an ice pick in 1940. The army that Trotsky founded was itself purged. 40,000 officers were arrested, almost 15,000 shot, and the rest sent to camps to be worked to death. 
Stalin was more or less saying to the people of the Soviet Union, look, nobody is beyond my reach. Nobody is safe. Not only did Stalin execute his victims, he erased them from history altogether. He spared no one. Nikolai Yeshov, the NKVD commander, was arrested and shot in 1940. Stalin made him disappear too. Not even Stalin's wife, Nadezhda, survived the Great Terror. Driven to despair by his treatment of her, during a party in 1932 for his ministers, she left the room and shot herself. Ironically, the more severe Stalin became, the more he was revered by the people. A combination of propaganda and the ever-present threat of persecution turned Stalin into a demigod. This became known as the cult of personality. The idea, as the cult developed, was that Russian people owed everything to the party, to the state, and to the leader. So, in this sense, the whole society was in debt. One important aspect of this, um, what I call the economy of the gift, was the importance of thanking Stalin because you were in debt and you were thanking for all these gifts and presents in a sense, all the social services, everything you got. And the slogan, thank you, comrade Stalin, for a happy childhood, represented that idea that children were having a happy childhood because Stalin had provided for them. One of those happy children was the girl who appeared in this photograph. Called Friend of the Little Children, it was taken in 1936 and shows Stalin holding six-year-old Gelia Markizova. She remembers the day the photograph was taken. I got up and took the flowers to the presidium. When somebody asked me where I was going, I said to Stalin, then everybody started shouting, kiss him, kiss him. I remember the feeling of happiness because I was in Stalin's arms. The next morning I woke up and I was unbelievably famous. Gelia's celebrity was short-lived. A year later, Gelia's father, Ardan, was accused of spying and arrested. My mother said she wasn't worried at all, because my father simply knew that he wasn't guilty. He said the confusion would be sorted out, and he'd be back soon. It all turned out to be very different. He was shot in 1938. A year after her father's murder, Gelia's mother was found with her throat cut. The official explanation was suicide. But 50 years later, Gelia found out that her mother had been murdered on the orders of Stalin's new NKVD chief, Lavrentia Beria. In her KGB file, I found a letter to Beria from the local head of the NKVD in Tajikistan. The letter said that Dominika Fedorova Markizova lives in exile in our town. Her daughter was photographed in Stalin's arms. Also, she has gifts from Stalin and five photographs. We are worried that she is going to show off. That's exactly how they put it. Then there was a question, what should we do? Beria clearly wrote next to it in blue pencil, eliminate. Although Stalin's terror eased by 1939, a greater one awaited the Russian people in the shape of Adolf Hitler, the man who regarded Stalin as the real genius of political terror. On June the 22nd, 1941, the Nazis invaded Russia, but Stalin was completely unprepared. Weakened by the purges of the 1930s, almost 65% of the Red Army had been captured or killed in the first few months, and the Nazis were less than a mile from Moscow. A lot of people say what Stalin did for Russia was that he enabled them to push back the tanks of Hitler in World War II. But I would say that, in fact, 
Firstly, the invasion would never have got so far because all those people on the Western borderlands who welcomed Hitler with open arms would have fought against him. And secondly, the industrial, the agricultural, and the a base of the country and its morale would have been in a proper state to fight in 1941 instead of in 1943-4. In a conflict of unprecedented savagery, the Soviet people threw themselves into the war. But even as the Russians died in their millions at Stalingrad or starved to death in the siege of Leningrad, Stalin continued to terrorize them. If you had been in prison or in camp before the war, you were mobilized, you went to the front, whatever you did at the front and you came back, you were immediately rearrested and sent back. The repeaters, they were called. Now that, to my mind, does encapsulate the utter cruelty and cynicism of, this, of the Stalinist system. When Berlin fell in May 1945, the Russian people, who had seen 27 million of their compatriots die in the war, felt that they had earned a better future. It meant nothing to Stalin. The great tragedy of the whole Soviet experience was the sense that people were sacrificing for a day that never came. Now isolated behind an iron curtain, Stalin's paranoia increased. He found a new enemy in the one people who had suffered more than most during the war. A lot of leading Jews of, in all fields were arrested and accused of being in some kind of Zionist plot. In what became known as the doctor's plot, Jewish physicians were charged with poisoning people with drugs and killing them on the operating table. They were people who had no national loyalty, so it was natural to accuse the Jews. Stalin suspected that they were more loyal to the new state of Israel than to Soviet Russia. Stalin had already laid plans for the mass trial and deportation of Soviet Jews. We'll never know if Stalin's final solution would become reality. On the night of March the 1st, 1953, Russia's dictator suffered a stroke and died. It is difficult to even list all my friends and acquaintances. Those closest to me, my relatives, they all died, despite being completely innocent. They were arrested, taken away, beaten up. They are forced to confess to everything and shot. It happened to millions. The greatest tragedy for the Russian people is that the man who murdered relentlessly throughout his years in power whom the West affectionately nicknamed Uncle Joe, would never be called to account for his crimes.